I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's perfectly fine. If you're at a Parker campus, there's a table right behind you, right uh, there at the back, and you can just grab a Bible off of that and go turn to page 962. If you're at our Sweetwater campus, then you can just grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 962, and you'll be able to follow along with us as we look at the Beatitudes. And as, uh, as always, if you're at any of our campuses, then, uh, and you need a Bible, take one. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you need a Bible, please ask. We'll get you a Bible because we want everyone to have God's Word and read God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, hey, uh, just a, a real quick thing. I want to mention you can sign up for financial peace when you leave. Uh, Pastor Peter already talked about that, and that is a great, great program. If you're uh, Someone who, uh, like I was at one point, where you kind of go, I really don't know what I'm doing with all this money that God's given me, but it's not going far enough, and, uh, and I'm not, uh, I don't feel like I'm on top of things. You're always stressed by that. Then sign up for Financial Peace University. It is an excellent course. And, and then the other thing I want to mention is, you may or may not know this, but you know, we have a Christian school here at Calvary, Calvary Christian Academy, uh, about uh, 290 students, uh, K3 through 8th grade right now. And they are... Uh, we are having a gala, a party, you know, call it what you want, uh, but a party on the 25th uh, after the Saturday night service. And if you are interested in attending that, of course, the tickets cost, um, you know, and uh, you, there's a table uh, on your left as you exit in the main way that you can sign up for the gala. Now, there's not a lot of seats left, but we'd love to fill them up with people who support Calvary and want to see a, a Christian school. And of course, it is a fundraising dinner, so uh, we would love for you to uh, come and have a great time and also support a great ministry that is changing lives of students. Uh, like I said, we've got uh, about 290 students and a, a wonderful school. So uh, if you don't know about that, you might as well come and learn about it. And if you do know about it, then uh, sign up and support. And let's fill those tables up so that, uh, that they don't have to show up tomorrow uh, or the next week. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells a story. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king that called his servants to give account. And a servant was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. That's meaningless to us. We don't know what talents are. It just sounds like a whole lot of something, right? 10,000 talents. Uh, 10,000 talents was an unpayable sum of money for this uh, servant, whoever that servant was. A talent was basically 20 years wages for an average person. 20 years. The guy owed 200,000 years wages. Think about that. If someone came to you right now and said, hey, uh, we're going to settle accounts and you owe us $9 billion. Now, there's a few people in America that could pay that, a very few, uh, it, but I don't think anyone in this room or in our Parker campus uh, has that kind of money. Does anybody have that kind of money? Because if so, we're in a building program. <laughs> and we would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you right after the service. Uh, and... Uh, no, I mean, but it was an unpayable sum. Most, most of us go, we laugh when someone goes, $9 billion, I couldn't pay that. There's no way. You, you couldn't pay it either. And, and uh, so, so here we are, and we're, we're kind of at that point where we go, all right, so I don't have the money to pay that, and uh, what do I do? So this servant who, who didn't have the money, the master said, okay, sell him, sell his family, sell his possessions. Uh, we're talking about debtor's prison and put him in debtor's prison until all of it should be repaid. He doesn't have 20,000 lifetimes to pay it back, but uh, anyway. But sell him, and, and his life is over as he knows it. And the servant fell down on his knees, and he begged the master, please give me more time, and I will pay you back everything. Now, that's a nice thought, but it's an impossible sentiment. Give me more time. The master had compassion on him, and said, your debt is forgiven. The servant got up, went out, saw one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. Again, that's meaningless to us. We don't know what that is. 100 denarii. It's not chump change, though. Okay, it's like $10,000 today. 
If you had a friend that owed you $10,000 and you owed somebody else $9 billion, you might want to collect. Right? So he says to that servant, pay me what you owe me. And that servant says, uh, I, I can't pay you. And he falls down on his knees, just like the other servant did. And he says, give me more time and I'll pay you back everything, which was doable. I mean, I don't want to owe someone $10,000, but if I did, I could probably pay it back over time, right? You probably could too. That servant says, no, sell him and put him in desert debtor's prison until all of it is paid back. There are other servants around. They're watching this. They don't like it. In fact, they're angry about it. And they go back and they tell the king, hey, you know that servant that you forgave 10,000 talents? Here's what he did to Fred. I don't know what the servant's name was. I just gave him a name. <laughs> he said, here's what he did. This guy owed him $10,000 and he sold him into a debtor's prison. And the king was angry. And he called that servant back in. And he said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all the debt that you owed me. How could you not forgive your fellow servant? The debt that he owed you. And then he commanded that this guy be sold and his family sold and all the possessions sold and he's put in debtor's prison until all the debt should be paid. So forever. And then Jesus ends the story by saying, in the same way, my heavenly father will do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So as we continue our series on the good life, can I tell you just really plainly that God is serious about forgiveness? God is serious about forgiveness. In fact, the, the parable I just told you is found in Matthew 18, verse 21 through 35, and, and it's called the parable of the unmerciful servant. And, and, and I want you to know that if you read the Bible, which I encourage you to read and apply God's word, but if you read the Bible, especially the gospels, you'll find that the strongest warnings in the, in the gospels that Jesus gives are, are really directed at, at two people for two things. Number one, the religious leaders and their hypocrisy. He has strong condemnation for the religious leaders and their hypocrisy. And then, for everyone, he has strong warnings about forgiveness. Forgiveness. In the same way your heavenly Father will do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That's how the, the unmerciful servant ends. But we, that's not the only thing that he said. We know this because Jesus taught us how to pray. Right? You guys know the Lord's Prayer? Okay, if you're Catholic background, the Our Father. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our... Okay, more trespassers than debts here. <laughs> I grew up with debts. Okay, so forgive us our trespasses as... Okay, stop right there. Did you ever realize that Jesus set us up when he taught us to pray? I mean, did you realize that he's going, hey, God, I want you to forgive me in the same way that I'm forgiving my fellow. Wait, what was that? That's how he taught us to pray. God, forgive me as I forgive the people who've sinned against me. That's how I want you to forgive me. Uh, we don't usually include it in the Lord's Prayer, but right after the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 Jesus said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. God is serious about forgiveness. It almost sounds, or you could argue, if you want to argue wrongly, like we earn forgiveness by forgiving. But that is not what Jesus is teaching. That is not what he's saying. What Jesus is trying to communicate, what we need to hear is that Forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. Look at the person sitting around you and just say, forgiven people forgive people. See, some of you are laughing because you're like, I, I don't know if I got that right. No, if you are forgiven by God, then you forgive people. If you don't forgive, it's because you probably haven't actually experienced God's grace or you don't understand what God has done for you, which is forgiveness. I mean, the servant in the story didn't get it. Did you catch that? 
The servant in the story, he's, you know, all your debt is forgiven and he's out there trying to get the money to pay it back. That's why he's a jerk. Because he doesn't understand that he's been forgiven. He doesn't get it. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is actually the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. I mean, it's personal. You believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Then please understand this truth. We are a people of mercy. We are a people of mercy. Our identity is in Jesus who taught us to forgive, as, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. We're a people of mercy because our Savior is Jesus who modeled this on the cross when he prayed, Father, do what? Forgive. forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He showed us what mercy looks like in the flesh as he was suffering. So if you struggle to forgive others, Please listen to this message tonight. If you're trying to earn forgiveness, then listen. If you can't forgive yourself, then please hear this message today. The good life with Jesus begins when we receive mercy. The good life with Jesus begins when we receive mercy. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, said, For by grace are you saved through faith. That's not even of yourself. That's the gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone should brag about it. No one should boast because we're saved by grace. I want everyone to receive the grace of God. Let me say that again. My personal desire is that every single person would receive the grace of God. I want you to know that your sins are forgiven and that heaven is your destiny. Okay, that's, that. I mean, if... If you're joining us in person or online at one of our campuses, I want you to know that your sins are forgiven and that heaven is your destiny. That, that, I want you to have that certainty and I want you to like be going, I hope I make it. I want you to know that. So I want everyone who is listening in the room or at home, I want you to personally encounter the mercy of God. Now here's the reality. You can't earn God's grace. You can't purchase the mercy of Christ and you don't deserve forgiveness. I, I, I listen to so many people express the thought that they're not doing enough to earn God's grace. They're not doing enough to be forgiven. I hope that I'm gonna be forgiven. Now, all of that is just, you can't earn it. You can't be good enough. You don't deserve it. None of those things are ever gonna happen. So if you think you're not doing enough, congratulations, you're right. You can't. God's grace is only received as a gift. That's it. The unmerciful servant didn't realize the gift. Let me say that again. The unmerciful servant didn't realize the gift. He was forgiven all of his debt. He just wasn't living it. He, he wasn't acting like he was forgiven. He was acting like he had this giant debt that he had to pay. So he requested more time to repay an impossible debt, and he was not granted time to earn forgiveness. He was forgiven all his debts. Huge difference. So can I just ask you, do you realize the offer of mercy from Jesus? Do you, do you realize what he's offering you? You know, I can't see your heart. I don't, you know, can't read your mind. I don't know where you are in this walk with God, but I want you to realize that God is offering you complete forgiveness through his son, Jesus. That's why we want people to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus because he's the only one who can change your life. He's the only one who can forgive your sins. He's the only one who can be your savior. So, do you realize the offer of mercy from Jesus? Because I just witnessed too many people who are still trying to pay off the impossible debt or earn grace. And it's so frustrating. So frustrating. Um, I grew up in, in a lot of good churches where they preached grace. 
They preached the Bible. They preached salvation by Jesus. They preached all your sins are forgiven. They preached the mercy. But can I just tell you, they didn't live it very well. They lived like they were the unmerciful servant trying to pay off a debt. People were burdened. I got to do this, and I have to do that, and I got to serve, and I got to yeah, I got to go here. And hey, stop smiling. You're having too much fun. This is serious business. And and, and you know what's crazy? If you know that you are forgiven of all your sins, I mean, it's it, it's like the burden is lifted and you have joy and you have freedom and you get to celebrate that and, and life is great no matter what because you are forgiven. See, I want you to recognize God's grace for what it is. I want you to receive the mercy of Jesus. So stop asking for more time. Stop trying harder to be good. Just admit you need help and ask Jesus to save you, period. And this is essential for all of us because look, I don't want what I deserve. I do not want what I deserve. I don't think you do either because Romans 6, the Apostle Paul says, the wages of sin is death. Uh, I'm a sinner. I know that. I have witnesses if you're not sure. (laughs) Been married to the key witness for 38 years. Um, You're a sinner. I got witnesses. (laughs) People sitting around you, people who know you. See, as you said, right now, a lot of the, the world doesn't even recognize that they're sinners. And it's tragic because you're not going to ask for forgiveness if you don't know that you've sinned. But the wages of sin is death. Which means that because of my behavior, because of my choices, because of my actions of rebellion against God and thinking that I know better than God does about how I should live my life, I have earned the right to go to hell. I bought a one-way ticket. I paid for it with my actions. I don't want what I deserve. Because what I deserve is an eternity of damnation. But this verse doesn't end with the wages of sin is death. It continues with, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, I I earned hell, but Jesus offers me heaven. That's what mercy is. This is what grace looks like, that we deserve the worst that we could get. And Jesus says, but if you'll ask me, I'll rescue you from hell, and I will give you heaven as the replacement. (laughs) Guys, I'm telling you, you're not going to get a better deal than that, ever. I mean, this is what we celebrate. This is why we sing. This is Jesus, our living hope right here. And so the only way to alter that destiny that you deserve is God's grace. And if you haven't yet received God's grace, would you do it today? Just do it today. If you're, look, if you're sitting at one of our campuses, if you're joining us online and you're thinking, I'm trying to be good enough and I hope I make it, no, just stop right now and stop listening to me and just surrender to Jesus. Ask him, Lord, I, I need your help. Please forgive me of my sins. I'm gonna follow you. And he's gonna do that. Confess him as Lord. He'll save you. And by the way, if you do that, we would love to know it. Our prayer team will be here at the front after the service. Come up and pray with one of them. Tell them, hey, I surrendered to Jesus today. Or find one of the pastors after the service. Like, find me. It's kind of easy to find me. I'm in uh, the jersey of a team not playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and, uh, and just tell us, hey, I surrendered to Jesus. We'll celebrate with you. It's a lot better than the Super Bowl anyway. If you can't do any of those, at least grab one of the Connect cards and uh, fill it out and drop in the offering box or email us if you're online because we want to know, we want to celebrate you. If you haven't received God's grace, please do so today. And if you, if you have received God's grace, if you know Jesus is your Savior, if you know heaven is your uh, destiny, if you know that you've been adopted into God's family, then receive mercy and give grace. Give grace. Um, We're finally to our text, by the way, Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I know, you guys could all say that with me, right? You don't even need to read it. You've, you've got it down. You've got it memorized, because that's the challenge. Five weeks, five verses so far. Um, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Do you want more mercy in your life? <laughs> like six people want more mercy in their life. <laughs> Some of you are like, bring on the judgment. <laughs> okay, it's either more mercy or more judgment. Which one do you want? Mercy. Okay, mercy. <laughs> so there's nobody like going, judgment, please. <laughs> life is too good. I need to suffer. Um, look, if you want more mercy, then give grace. Be merciful. Forgive. I mean, Jesus is telling us we reap what we sow, and he's using it specifically at the point of mercy. If you want mercy, then be merciful. Because the person who's merciful is blessed, and they're going to be blessed by receiving mercy. Yeah, so he tells us, hey, you want more mercy in your life? Then be merciful as a person. This is the good life. Because we already looked at the fact that God is serious about forgiveness and that we anger our Heavenly Father when we refuse to forgive. Remember, we're a people of mercy. And forgiven people do what? They forgive people. Yeah, forgive. Yes, hey, always add that people at the end because it's really easy to forgive in theory and not in reality. So forgiven people forgive. That's what we do because we've been forgiven. So if you want to live the good life, then give away grace. Because when you're a person of grace, amazing things happen. So when you're a person of grace, relationships are restored. Relationships are restored. Most of our stress, most of our anxiety, most of our fear is about relationships. We're worried about our spouse. We're worried about our kids. We're worried about our parents. We're worried about our siblings. We're worried about our friends. We're worried about our coworkers. We're worried about our boss. All of those things. And when we give grace... When we give it abundantly, it alters the dynamic of every single relationship. I wish I had time to just give some examples. I'm going to give one. Um, if you're married, you'll get this, right? So um, giving grace means that you respond differently to situations that ordinarily turn into fights. Like, all right, let's just confess for a moment. How many of you talk to your spouse from the other room? Go ahead, raise your hands. I know you're all guilty because we all do it. A lot of times we're walking away from them, talking to them. And, and so they don't hear us and we don't hear each other. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, the wife will come home and say, hey, honey, do you want some figs and grapes? And he's like, why did you call me a pig and an ape? <laughs> and she's like, I didn't call you that. And he goes, I know what I heard. And she goes, you never listen to me anyway. And next thing you know, it's a fight. <laughs> right? I was talking before the service with the crowd, young lady. Her fingers are damaged. And I said, what'd you do? And I don't even remember what her answer was, but it, it sounded like she said, I hit it on oranges. <laughs> and I said, what? Oranges? No, door hinges. Oh, okay. <laughs> Slammed it in the door hinge. I... Look, that's exactly what happens to us. And when we live without grace, we have a fight. But when you give grace well, grace clarifies. Hey, what did you say? Because I heard something ridiculous. And, and the wife would say, oh, I got some figs and grapes. I know you like them. Did you want some? And then you bust out laughing. and go, hey, do you know what I heard you say? I heard you call me a pig and an ape. <laughs> and then you can both laugh about it because she was being kind and you just didn't hear her. And that's what, see, do you understand? Grace clarifies before accusing. We listen with grace. That's where the clarifying comes in. We speak with grace. Kindness. We judge and evaluate with grace. You go, how do you judge with grace? Well, judging with grace just simply means you assume the best about people instead of the worst. When people say something about, hey, did you hear about John? Do you just go, oh, that's terrible. Tell me more. Or do you go, that doesn't sound like him. I mean, I've known him for a long time, and he's a stand-up guy. I don't think he'd do that. 
Well, I mean, honestly, you, you have to look at your reactions to situations because you might be living with judgment instead of grace and grace assumes the best. And see, if you try this, it, it, you'll see God begin to transform your relationships. Here's how the Apostle Paul explained it, how it would work in your life. Ephesians 4, if you want to turn there, it's page 1161 in your Bibles. Paul says, uh, in verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you and um, speak with grace for those who hear it. So here, here's what Paul is saying. We can speak with grace and forgive people and the Holy Spirit who's in us rejoices and we're blessed. Or we can hold grudges, we can get angry and bitter and grieve the Holy Spirit and live in misery. Hmm, which one sounds better to you? It's our choice. If we're going to give grace, then relationships are restored. And if we give grace, we experience personal healing. Um, look, you've been hurt by people. The pain of offenses is real. We are scarred. Some of you physically because of offenses. Some of you emotionally. Some of you spiritually. Like, we're hurting. But the path to healing is through mercy. The good life goes through mercy. And when we refuse to forgive, what fills our life? See, we, we actually just read it, right? Bitterness, rage, anger, wrath, malice, slander. Does that sound like the good life to you? I, I don't want to live that way. In fact, the only people who want to hang out with angry, bitter people are angry, bitter people. And if all your friends are angry and bitter, you might want to look in the mirror. Because I don't think you want to be angry and bitter, but uh, what happens is we hold on to this stuff and it pollutes our souls. Forgiveness is for you. Let me say that again. We, well, I tend to get this wrong. I'm not going to forgive them. They don't, they, they need to suffer. No, Jesus is saying, pardon, pardon my expression, but please, my idiot children, listen to this. If you forgive, you heal. If you forgive, you heal. If you hold on to it, you die. You suffer. You're the one who's punishing yourself. You see, when you forgive, it blesses you. And when you receive it, that's a joy because we all want to be forgiven by God. But when you give it, you also are blessed because of that. So when we forgive others, it cleanses our soul of the trash that is in our, our lives. That's why grace is so wonderful to give. So think of it this way. Mercy just simply means you're taking out the trash in your soul. How many of you like smelly trash in your house? Anyone like smelly trash in your house? Nobody likes smelly trash in your house. Hey, do you ever, do you ever like, look, it's my job to take the garbage out in our house. And sometimes Meralda will say, take the trash out, please. Oh, okay, take the trash out. And then sometimes I'll walk in the house and go, oh, I need to take the trash out. <laughs> Any of you ever walked in? Like, oh, we've, yeah. Now, here's the thing. If you don't take the trash out, do you know that your nose, is, uh, the, sen the smell sense adjusts faster than any of your other senses? You can get comfortable living with stench. No, you really can. You can get used to it. And you know how you can tell? Walk into other people's houses and go, whoa! <laughs> right? Oh, these people are nose blind. I mean, really? Right? Uh, uh, you guys have all been there. You try not to judge, but you're judging. And... That's what our lives smell like when we don't forgive. 
You wonder why people don't want to come hang out with you? Maybe it's because you're not forgiving and your life stinks. Your soul stinks. You're not fun to be around. You're not a joy. You're angry. You're accusative towards everybody and everything. And, and your friends are always busy doing other things and you're wondering what's up and maybe it's because your soul stinks and you need to take the trash out and that means forgiving the hurts. Maybe you've promised you'll never forgive and Jesus is saying, hey, um, forgive in the same way that I forgave you. Or did you hear me when I said something about forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? See, this is why Jesus counsels forgiveness. He tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us because he knows that's the path to healing. So, look, try it. Give grace and you'll find healing. And then when we give grace, we know God's delight. We know God's delight. Look, we started with the parable of the unmerciful servant. In the story, we saw the king's anger. We saw that God is displeased with unforgiveness and lack of mercy. And, and, and here's the thing. If you want to live in God's favor, if you desire to feel the delight of the Father, if you long for the blessings and presence and power of God, then choose a life of mercy. Choose a life of mercy. It leads to the good life. And, and, and let me just say this. If you really want to forgive, but you don't know how, and you've been holding on to a grudge, you've been holding on to pain for a long time, that, look, that's what counseling is for. That's what Celebrate Recovery is for. That's what, you, you know, you, you go to your friends that you trust and you say, help me do this. It's not an easy journey to forgive. But it's worth taking. And you can't get there until you say, hey, I need to forgive this person. And, and the first prayer is, God, help me to forgive. Help me to forgive. And he'll do that. He will because he'll delight in your obedience. After all, we are a people of mercy. And Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. One more thing. In real life, um, the way this plays out is you're always facing decisions. You always have those moments where you have to decide, am I gonna pass judgment or am I gonna demonstrate grace? Am I going to be a person of kind of assume the worst and act on that or assume the best and act on that? Uh, what am I going to do? And I, a long time ago, I, I just kind of came to the conclusion that when I was in doubt, I'm going to err on the side of mercy. When I'm in doubt, I'm going to err on the side of mercy. Now, that's just my personal conviction based on Scripture. But I wanted to leave you with something to think about because Jesus in scriptures, rebukes people who condemn others. Usually they're religious people, by the way. And Jesus is rebuking them. He's saying, you're wrong. I've yet to find a place where Jesus rebukes somebody for being too gracious, too merciful. And he says that the merciful are blessed. So I don't know about you, but I choose more mercy for my life. Because blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. Let's pray. Father, we cannot thank you enough for the grace that we have received. We do not deserve it at all, but you have poured out your uh, grace on us, and we rejoice in that. We just want to say thank you and, and tell you that we love you because of that. But God, we also confess that we find it difficult to forgive often. So teach us how to be your people of mercy. God, just show up in our lives and point it out clearly so that we can become uh, those forgiven people who forgive people. So that we can honor Jesus, so that we can cause the Holy Spirit in our lives to rejoice and he will lead us to blessing. So God, that's our prayer. We desperately need you to teach us how to forgive. So we invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.